don't be nice just because you want socks. I know your game. We still have loads, by the way, and I'm not taking them home, so I expect to see a few more of you during lunch. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the D-shell pattern. It's really, really trivial. It's super basic, and I'm hoping that we'll all start to adopt this if you're not doing it already. So it only requires one change in the way that we work with Docker. But first, a little bit about me. I'm actually not sure if I can talk about myself for 15 seconds, but um, I am a developer advocate at Influx Data. I'm on the Kubernetes release team. I'm Scottish, if you hadn't noticed, and I love to esoteric programming languages. So if anyone here is familiar with Pony, then I would love to have a chat with you later because it's my current kind of uh, fun project. Uh, and a small bit of news. Some people don't like working with Docker, all right? I work with a lot of people that write JavaScript, and they just run Node on their machines, and Docker isn't a tool for them. It's an inconvenience. But we have to remember that Docker is actually really useful. We get to encapsulate the operating system dependencies or actual application dependencies, and it gives us something that is deployable as an artifact to our production infrastructure. So the D-shell pattern, like I said, is very simple. Hopefully, most of you have a Docker file inside of your repo already. Hopefully, you've got a Docker Compose file that you can orchestrate any third-party dependencies such as databases. And all I really want you to do is to add a make file. Nice and simple. But first, what I want to make sure is that the people that do have a Docker file are going to add a Docker file. Right? Multi-stage builds are a thing. We really start, have to start embracing this. I do not want to see three Docker files inside a single repository. This is a multi-stage build. And you can see here, the thing that's important is we have a development layer. Now, I can put all of the tooling that I need inside of this layer so that I can use this container as if it was my local machine. Here, I'm adding Vim, Git, and Make. Add whatever you require. With the Docker Compose, what we're actually going to do is try and make it as painful as possible for anyone to not use our tooling. <laughs> exactly. So I tweak my Docker Compose, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but I tweak it in a way that you can't just run Docker Compose up. What I want people to do is to use this make target called a D shell, which instead of doing a Docker Compose up, does a Docker Compose run. When you do a run, you have to then add a few extra flags, which I'm not going to have time to go over, but these make it an interactive environment. I'm inside a container with a command line. Making it impossible to avoid this tooling means overriding the entry point so that echoes, you can't do this. You also need to publish the service ports, because it's not done by default unless you do an up. And you also have to override the entry point so that we get a shell. So for Alpine, I'll use Ash. Now, controversial. Don't use Docker Compose version 3. Everyone says, why would I use 2? It's a downgrade. It's not. They're different paradigms. Uh, 2 has some very cool side effects, or 3 takes away some things that I personally couldn't live without. Number one, depends on with service checks. Right? How many times have you put a sleep into a complicated entry point file waiting for your MySQL or Postgres database to be healthy before you load your data? Right? We can do this with version 2. Secondly, 12-factor. Right? Make sure we're loading in environment variables uh, through an ENV file or using the environment syntax itself. Now, hopefully, everyone is familiar with a make file. Again, this is not revolutionary. It's a very old tool, and it's very simple to make. Pun not intended. But this is how the sausage is made. You add, this is documentation as well as tooling, right? Anyone can open this make file and understand how to build and compile your application and how to run it. So make files are great. And here we just have like a make up depths, and it runs our mix command if we're running Elixir. And um, what I would suggest is that I am a big System of a Down fan, so whenever I type make up into my terminal, I actually sing it like Chop Suey. Only a few people are going to get that reference. Uh, and that'll get us, so we're in an interactive environment. Inside of a Docker container, we run make up. When you're back on the host, we have to be able to clean that up. So Docker Compose down, we're still going to use that. V will kill all the volumes, and RMI local means any images we build as part of our D-shell setup, we clean that up as well. A lot of people forget to do that, end up with a terrible disk space situation. This is the final API. I start by doing a make D-shell. It puts me inside of a container. I run a make up. I do all my tests, my depths, whatever. Everything should feel very local and native. And when I'm done, I do a D-clean, and that's it. And what I want you to take away from this is that you have to provide a single, concrete, reusable experience for people that want to use Docker and people that don't want to use Docker. The make file helps us do that. The so Docker is cool, but you can't force it on JavaScript developers. I've tried. 
Also, if you use VS Code, there's this awesome concept called remote containers, and this works perfect with the D-shell setup. You just create a small JSON file, point it to your Compose, tell it the name of the service that is your interactive container with all your tooling, and it does it all for you. It is fantastic. It also allows you to configure extensions that live inside of it as well. I, I am on Twitter. I love to talk about all these cool things. I'm going to run out of time, but thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found this useful.